part one, we debunked Jarrah's claim that the black spot in this false color image, indicating the presence of iron oxide in the area around the Apollo 15 landing site, somehow discredits the LRO photo. In part two, we debunked Jarrah's claim that the sunlit half of a shallow crater, which JAXA thinks was brightened up by the lunar module exhaust plume, also somehow discredits the LRO photo. In part three, we explain that after 40 years, Bill Casing's lunar dust would have settled and not be visible in the LRO photo. We debunk Jarrah's claim that you should be able to see a disturbance in the surface photos taken by the Apollo 15 astronauts, and we showed photos of the sweep patterns under the lunar modules caused by the exhaust gases coming out of the descent engine, which Jarrah and comedian Joe Rogan said do not exist. In the final part of his movie, Jarrett rehashes more old material and, and chants the hoax conspiracist mantra about how the descent engine should have blown a blast crater in the moon's surface, which I thought was debunked years ago. Now, most hoax conspiracists recite the five-ton maximum thrust scenario. Contained over a small area, say like three and a half square feet, such as in this hover test of the Armadillo X-Prize Cup 2005 vehicle, that much force might carve out a noticeable hole in the lunar dust. But considering that the lunar module had burned 90% of its fuel and weighed about 1.4 lunar tons by the time it reached the lunar surface, five tons of thrust would obviously send that bird back out into space, rather rapidly in fact. Instead, Jarrah makes a conservative estimate that the engine was throttled back to 30% with 3,000 pounds of thrust, which would put the lunar module at near hover, or depending on the horizontal motion, dropping at 2 to 3 feet per second, which is dead right. He nailed it. So, 3,000 pounds of thrust? That sounds big enough to blow a crater into something, doesn't it? Let's see. This is a photograph of a rocket engine being tested in a simulated high-altitude environment at the U.S. Air Force's AEDC rocket propulsion labs. Since the engine is in a near vacuum, the exhaust plume expands very rapidly when it leaves the nozzle. That's not a problem since Newton's third law does its thing up in the throat of the engine. In this case, the nozzle is said to be underexpanded. This occurs whenever the pressure of the gas exiting the nozzle is greater than the ambient pressure. Of course, when the ambient is a vacuum, like on the moon, this will always be the case. This particular plume has a spread angle of about 85 degrees. Save that number in your short-term memory. Compare this to a rocket engine firing in normal atmosphere. Here, the nozzle is said to be ambient because the pressure at the nozzle is equal to ambient pressure. In this situation, the plume comes straight down out of the nozzle. This is more efficient because the force from the engine is directed straight back in the opposite direction of the rocket's motion, and it makes it move forward. Now, let's look at the lunar module descent engine and see if we can figure out just how much pressure this puppy was putting out. First, we have a nozzle with radius r. We can get the nozzle area from that. The exit pressure is the force divided by the nozzle area. The engine is cut off when the nozzle is at height h above the surface. The gas is exiting with a spread angle of alpha. We see a right triangle from the vertex of the spread angle down to the surface. There is a similar right triangle from the edge of the nozzle downward. From these two triangles, we can calculate how much the plume spreads by the time it reaches the surface. We then know the surface area at the end of the plume and the pressure on the surface. This assumes there is no loss getting the force from the nozzle to the moon's surface. Now, let's plug in some numbers. The force is 3,000 pounds. Depending on which source you use, the nozzle is 4.5 to 5 feet across, so the radius was 27 inches minimum. That gives an exit area of about 2,300 square inches. Therefore, the exit pressure is less than 1 and 1 half PSI, absolute. That's interesting. A non-commercial leaf blower without any nozzle attachment to restrict airflow, like the one Jared demonstrates in his video, would have a nominal exit pressure of about half a psi, relative to atmosphere. That means the lunar module descent engine was only putting out about two to three times the pressure of a leaf blower. Wow! On most of the Apollo missions, the lunar module was in free fall for the last two to four feet. In the standard configuration, the end of the nozzle was about 18 inches higher than the landing pads. The last three Apollo missions took lunar rovers to the moon, and the nozzle was extended 10 inches to put more pressure up in the throat of the engine and improve the power. So the lowest any nozzle got before the commander shut off the engine was about 32 inches. And since the lunar module was moving very slowly in retrograde, that is backward with respect to the direction of the exhaust, 
the plume was probably shooting out at, let's say, 85 degrees. Since the nozzle was probably tuned for something greater than 3,000 pounds of force, the spread angle was probably actually more than that. That would make the pressure on the surface to be about 0.3 pounds per square inch. That's less than the pressure of Jarrah's leaf blower, spread out over a 70 square foot wide area. It's also about one-third of the pressure asserted by an astronaut walking on the moon in size 11 and a half boots. Even if you assume the lunar module smacked the ground before the engine was cut and buried the landing pads two inches into the lunar regolith, you would still have six inches clearance, and the surface pressure would be about 0.9 psi absolute, which is still less than an astronaut's footstep. Now, for comparison, consider an Apache helicopter landing in the Iraq desert during Desert Storm. The Apache weighs about 11,000 pounds empty, about the same as a lunar module would weigh on Earth. Even though an Apache needs more than 11,000 pounds of force to take off, slightly less to land, all they do is kick up a major dust cloud. They don't seem to dig very deep craters in these photos anyway. As you get farther away from the exhaust, the dust is disturbed less and less. Out at the fringe of the affected area, only the smallest dust particles are moved. The effect is similar to what a good auto body shop would do if you ever had a bumper replaced in your car. When they paint the new bumper, they will blend or feather the new paint into the old paint in the adjacent panels so that the repair is less noticeable. This feathering effect is one reason why you don't notice any disturbance anywhere in the Apollo surface photos, except for under the lunar module. And of course, the most overwhelming argument against the existence of blast craters would be that if Norman Rockwell didn't see the need for a crater, why should I? That makes the score fail to Rockwell 1, Jera 0. My only question after all this is what does a blast crater have to do with an LRO photo anyway? Nothing. Nothing. The whole second half of the video is a total distraction from the main subject. It doesn't support any argument for or against the LRO photos. I have just a few loose ends to wrap up, but we're out of time again, so we'll have to wait for part five of this series to summarize the various materials that Jerry uses to discredit the LRO photo of the Apollo 15 landing site and draw our conclusions on the overall validity of Jerry's video. Ciao, Moonhoax conspirators, wherever you are.